Welcome to the Cushing Library. My name is Debbie Kraft. Um, I am a volunteer and I am also the Vice President of the Cushing Board. This afternoon, the Cushing Public Library and Camden Conference are pleased to host the Zoom presentation by Cushing residents Brooke Harrington and Judith Bing. This is the second of our two events for this year's conference. We had Ellen Goldsmith's um, poetry session that took place this past fall. And the library is grateful to Camden Conference for its contributions to our library. Judy and Brooks' presentation is titled European Architectural Now, Social and Environmental Innovation. Brooke and Judy will describe 21st century projects that address pressing issues of climate change and social equality. Both presenters are retired architects and architecture professors who moved to Maine from Philadelphia 10 years ago. And now I would like to turn it over to Judy and Brooke. So thank you for coming. Architecture was defined uh, in, the, in the West way back in the, by the Romans. Uh, it was then slightly updated in the uh, 17th century. And in the 21st century, architecture really is very much concerned with sustainability, human comfort and delight. And so the uh, strip of photos you see are projects I'll be talking about. One of the first things that we looked at was uh, why are we still looking at Europe? And uh, basically, yes, we're part of a Western tradition, but if you take a look today, that uh, there's a ranking of uh, the most influential countries and you'll see that 14 of them are still in Europe in the 21st century. We're 20% through the 21st century. And one of the things we're looking about is uh, carbon emissions since the population has doubled in the last 60 years, world population. And so the amount of carbon dumped in has become very large. Um, but we should really look at the ecological footprint, which is more than just the carbon. It has to do with our food sources, uh, building, and uh, the amount of land we actually have to produce food for everyone. So here is a uh, slide that shows something that was in the uh, Boston Globe by a group called uh, Brainiacs. Uh, with the green background, it shows that with uh, a little less than two acres, you should be able to produce everything you need, electricity, uh, food, vegetables, raise uh, uh, meat protein and uh, corn. Uh, unfortunately, that's sort of a fallacy because what you can see is that uh, if you look at that footprint, that's the ecological footprint. And you see that it's not only the urban areas that you may live in, but it's also where the food comes from and also how you uh, absorb the carbon footprint that's created so that it's more like 40 or 50 acres per person. Uh, this is the house and the image on the left is actually for a family of four. The American Institute of Architects uh, commissioned someone back in 2010 to make a, uh, a diagram that, that helps us predict how much we can change our carbon footprint by building. And the uh, orange block is renovations and the, uh, let's say, yellow block is uh, new construction, 
but they're saying that 75% of the built environment can be changed. And so the need to uh, change by 2030 becomes uh, more important. We have here something called embodied energy and architects will know what that means maybe, uh, most do. Uh, basically, you take a raw material and you ship it to a place where it can be manufactured and you build it. And then there's the life of the building, which is usually around 50 years. And then it's either disposed of or it's recirculated. And so there are terms that are called cradle to grave from uh, the first gathering raw materials to the eventual uh, demolition disposal or recirculating cradle to cradle. So every material requires some sort of treatment. And what you see on this uh, left column is common construction materials and the amount of energy required for the material to make it useful. And the red dots indicate those that are most dear. You can see aluminum and this is very high. On the other hand, <clears throat> embodied energy on a final building has to be looked at in terms of the total amount of material that's used. So even though concrete is a uh, doesn't require as much energy as aluminum, there's much more of it on a site. So per pound or kilogram, it has a much greater effect. So I'm looking at 10 different projects that were built in the uh, 21st century. And this one is uh, in Spain. And it's in a small village near the Pyrenees. It's uh, very close to Barcelona. And it's using, using an ancient technique, which is called rammed earth. And basically they compact earth, they put up wooden forms, uh, fairly short ones, and they pound the uh, earth. They put a little cement in there, and then they cover the whole thing with stucco. Uh, Adobe. So this is a project that was uh, completed in the 21st century. Uh, it uses all the ancient techniques that were used. It uses uh, mechanical devices to help uh, make it faster in the making of it. Uh, and they reinforce this uh, packed earth building walls with wood. So it's like for architects, it's like a bond beam to help uh, make it uh, rigid. And here are some views of the interior. Uh, it's, a it, it's a house, the couple that build it are both architects. Here is another project, which is interesting because it shows the preservation or the repurposing of an old villa. And basically they took out all of the interior walls, the majority of them. It is now a toy museum. It's a cultural uh, site for, uh, for children. It has a playroom and it has a toy museum but it also has the foundation of Fracchia. Umberto Fracchia was a famous uh, author and uh, impresario. So here's the first floor, this diagram here, the plan, and you can see that outside of the building, they added stairs and an elevator and a bathroom, and they opened up the interior floor. This 
little red dot shows the place from where the, the picture was taken. This red dot is outside and it shows the children outside the staircase. They built a staircase with very light materials, uh, meaning glass and, and steel, and they covered it with uh, pieces of uh, letters, which are actually the poetry of uh, the artist and uh, writer Gianni Rodari. And uh, so it's basically surrounded. The other letters that are there are actually lines from the fairy tales and uh, poems. So here is uh, an adaptive reuse of a villa that has, has a substantial structure. Here is a view from the other side that shows the uh, exterior stair and where the lift is. And this is uh, a game room and toy museum on the second level which is this large space here. And that red dot shows where that picture was taken. And the top floor is an auditorium. And that's what the auditorium looks like. So <clears throat> moving now to a brand new building, which was built on what they call a brownfield site, a deserted site. There was a, a building a warehouse building that was actually uh, caught on fire. And uh, there's a large Muslim po population in Cambridge, England. There are about uh, 5,500 people. They didn't have a large uh, mosque for themselves. So this was uh, <clears throat> a big uh, event to try to make, to correct that. So what you're looking at is the interior, the all these columns which open up into a tree-like shape are made of large and they're done by a single banding or double banding uh, on a five axis mill. And uh, it's a very simple uh, structure. There is a um, parking lot underneath the whole thing. So here is a Islamic garden, a portico, an atrium. Uh, this is cut through one of the narrow spaces and then the prayer hall, which we can see in a special uh, space on the outside. In plan, it looks like this. The orange line that you see is actually a bent line that shows where the section was taken through the building. Uh, the dotted uh, line here is a uh, dome that was put on. Uh, actually, it wasn't in the original plan, but one of the donors insisted they have a dome. Uh, oops, going the wrong way. This is the garden. This is the... Uh, atrium. This is the main space. This shows the complex making of these uh, glue lamb beams, columns. And uh, this shows actually the stresses in the different types of members that were bent into this shape. You can see there is a collar here, which stabilizes the relationship of the pieces. They hope to do the whole thing in England, very close to the site, but they didn't have uh, the technology available to make the and machine these pieces. So they were actually made in Switzerland and shipped to uh, Cambridge. Here's another uh, brownfield site. And there's a photograph at the top, which is in uh, 1926. Uh, anybody who's uh, been to Denmark may have had uh, Carlsberg beer. Their brewery was started by uh, E.C. Jakobsen. 
1847 who used a scientific method to make beer. Well, it was very successful. Uh, and he won uh, many uh, European awards for his beer. They kept this brewery active until 2008, at which point the land was turned over to a consortium. One of the members is the uh, Jacobson family. So you can see the plan here at the bottom, the large plan shows the yellow buildings, which are all new buildings, and the brown buildings, which are reuse of existing buildings. And so I'm going to look at one of the projects here. Uh, up here, this little inset drawing shows the special bricks they made. They wanted to keep the uh, feeling of the uh, brewery and its uh, brickwork. The project was named Theora House, and Theora was one of the four children of Jakobsen. And this was built in 1902, and it's uh, sort of one of the iconic buildings within uh, what they call Carlsberg City, which is a section of, uh, of uh, Copenhagen. So what you see, it, these two diagrams that show the new buildings and the old buildings. The only building they preserved was one wing of the Yi storage building. And you could see how that has been used for offices and the rest is actually apartments and shops on the ground floor. So here is a, a better view of the uh, one of the elephant sculptures or granite. This building is the existing building, part of the old East building. And you can see with the old brickwork, they did special uh, setting of the bricks. And uh, here are the special bricks that were used on the face of this. The building is made of concrete, the new buildings, uh, and then covered with brick facing. Uh, the ground floor has an interior court, which is received by from two passages. The inside is a white material that's covered with a lattice, and the plan is for the uh, plantings to grow over it. There are on the ground floor, there are uh, shops, a cafe, and uh, some uh, retail stores. And then above are apartments. And here with the light bright brown tone is the old building, uh, <coughs> which is the yeast building. And here's a view of it from the plaza. And this view here is taken right there that shows uh, the basic configuration. Okay, we're moving to Reykjavik, Iceland. And this is the uh, Harpa, Concert Hall and uh, uh, Conference Center. And this view is taken from the entrance walkway on the uh, south side. And this is taken from the harbor side where there's a breakwater. And you can see the upper floor that shows the three main auditoriums. This is the entrance floor where you come into the building. And then this is a section through that, the main concert space. And it's, uh, it was done by uh, Henning Larson with the uh, artist, Oliver Eliasson. And uh, basically uh, the strange, uh, Elevation, which is so pronounced, is uh, based on the uh, 
calcite crystals. And you can see here uh, the names of this. This is a concrete and steel building, mostly concrete for the uh, auditorium building. This is named after the uh, volcano on um, in Iceland. This is uh, named after the calcite crystals, and this is the northern lights. It has, of course, beautiful northern lights that change the facades. Uh, so to do this, they did a lot of special calculations. These are mock-ups of these uh, uh, rhomboidal and hexagonal faces that are created. So basically it's a three-dimensional object and there are a series of them that are put together. You can see there's a major steel uh, box girder, which actually ties and uh, supports this facade. And there's actually heating that comes in and goes into these chambers. This is a view from the bottom. This is actually up here is a example of the uh, Iceland spar type of uh, <clears throat> a type of crystal that was used for uh, over a hundred years for lenses. Here, here's some indication of one of the formations. Iceland, by the way, has a national population of three hundred and forty-four thousand. The city of Reykjavik is only 135,000. So uh, imagine something like this being attempted and the dedication to uh, making this place. Now this is in uh, Trondheim, Norway. And this building is called the Abratorkia uh, <laughs> Powerhouse. And uh, basically it's designed <clears throat> to catch the sun. This particular building is built with concern for the embodied energy of all the materials. And it's actually what's called a net plus building over its 60 year lifespan they anticipate, including the putting up of the building and the reuse of materials and so forth. It actually generates more energy than it uses about twice as much. So it supplies <coughs> energy to um, adjacent buildings and to a, uh, a transportation system that uh, runs all the buses uh, within Trondheim. Uh, what you see at the top here is an image looking right down onto the uh, a terrace that they have. And okay, optics say that when you foreshorten something, it changes its shape. So it appears to be a circle to people, but that's the shape of the open courtyard. This is the South Foundation, which the city comes up to this side. The harbor side uh, has this uh, facade. And uh, basically, it, uh, it's quite a wonderful place, in my opinion, from a distance. I'm going to start talking about this from the top floor. Architects usually take you in the front door, which is way down here. But I'm gonna start here because you'll notice a number of things. Large glass, uh, right there is something called uh, a Munkholen, which is an island fortress. It's in the uh, harbor. And uh, this picture was taken here, this picture was taken here. You can see the amount of light. You will notice 
that ceiling panels are left out. And the reason for that is as excess heat builds up, they want to dissipate it through the structure. So they're, they've got the ceiling tiles removed so that the heat doesn't come down. Now this is at the 63rd parallel, which means it's not far south of the Arctic Circle. Here is the uh, one of the middle floors, the picture taken here, looking this way, this side, and you can see that this is the level of the terrace. And you can see that, and this is the entrance level. You come in here and you check in here. It's used as an educational building. It's actually a speculative office building. <clears throat> it calls itself a powerhouse, but it doesn't act like a power plant. This is that courtyard and you can see uh, one of the things that happens in Scandinavia is they're very concerned that they have uh, access to natural daylight. So they actually limit the distance you can be away from a window in a lot of the coves. So that is a reason, another reason that the terrace is here because it basically ensures that the, that the people away from the outside perimeter have access to sun. And it shows uh, basically uh, the facade uh, that faces south, which has got, uh, um, it's, it's made completely of uh, photovoltaic panels. Uh, they save the energy on the concrete. They uh, put the windows where they do the most help. And they, uh, they have a core that uses heat pumps to actually cool the building through uh, using the water in uh, the harbor in the summer and in the winter, they capture heat uh, from the heat pump to pump to the area. Now this is uh, <coughs> called, uh, this is, uh, the uh, Kunsthaus in Graz in Austria, which is the second biggest city in, in Austria. And this is known as the uh, friendly uh, <clears throat> alien. And there was a competition in, that was won in 2000 and uh, it was built for 2003, which is very fast, given the fact that it's got this crazy shape and uh, experimentation with new materials. It was also uh, UNESCO a City of Design in 2011. It's an art museum that's Kunsthaus is, uh, what that translates as. It was known as, it's a biomorphic architectural form. It was designed by uh, Peter Cook and, uh, let's see, oops, wrong way. Colin Fournier, uh, who both taught at the uh, University College of London it's an international competition. They formed a firm for the building of it. This is called the number one exhibit space. This is number two exhibit space, and this is number three. Uh, <clears throat> this is what it looks like inside on the number three exhibit space. This is a walkway to a needle, a special place where you can go outside to look around the historic area that this is set in. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the uh, exhibitions, installations that really uses this freeform space. And here's another uh, <clears throat> installation that was done that uses more conventional, it uses walls that, had to, that are put in 
and then flat work is on that. This is on the second level, these two different installation. And this is the third level, which is a, a, a smaller space where they hang uh, flat screens that then project different artwork. Okay, this is this shows the complexity outside. It was a very hard to do because this was originally supposed to be a translucent building, so you could see the inside from outside. But the curator, after the competition was won, said, "I want a black box. I didn't want to be able to show whatever I want." And so the whole idea had to be turned inside out. And luckily it was because of, uh, they use actually some old fashioned technology to do this. This is uh, a lamella structure of steel so that there are no columns in that big space I showed you on the top. <clears throat> and it's done, think of a, a soccer ball and how the different geometries allow that shape to occur. Uh, on that ball. Well, in this case, it's not like a Bucky Fuller geodesic dome. It's a much more uh, designed form. And it required a lot of work, as you can imagine, to get this done. But the whole thing was built in two years, which is amazing. These are plexiglass panels. And under them are little... Uh, fluorescent circular light bulbs like you found in the kitchen. That's the way they describe it. And they were actually, they're called pixels. They're each designed so that they can be programmed. And so you can do artwork using this as your screen, like dots on a screen. And this shows, believe it or not, a drawing that shows how these go together. Here's the uh, waterproof membrane here. There's insulation and in this kind of structure below. And there are these eye holes, people, so that they look towards different important views within the city. So bear with me, we'll see if we can make this work. This was done in Berlin by a firm. They designed uh, the programming of this so that it all works together. So on the outside of the building, you can see artwork and it's completely programmed for different displays. There's a dancer on the outside of the building. Yeah. And That's amazing. one more, uh, here are some hands that are sort of massaging the form. It's a little strange, but interesting. Now I'm gonna cut this short here <coughs> so we can move on. Okay, now this is a, whoops, something moved from where I put it, but that doesn't matter. This is a power, a waste to energy power plant in Copenhagen on the outskirts. And it's uh, a hedonistic sta sustainable building. So basically what they said is let's have fun with this. So they've done this, but they've used the roof of this, the outside of it, as a playground for people. So there's skiing, there, there's gardens, there's uh, rock climbing, and it's providing uh, electricity. It's, uh, it's power for energy for 150,000 households. It's taking, I think, let's see, 400 pounds, 400,000 tons of waste per year. Uh, it 
collects waste from five to 700,000 inhabitants and 46,000 companies. And it gives 25% uh, more energy output than the old plant that it replaced, which was 45 years old. Yeah. Here are some views of the inside. These are offices right here for the administration. And uh, basically you can see the upper slope and the walking gardens. And you can see, uh, this is actually looking Southwest, I think. Here's the rock climbing wall. And there is a club that you can become a member and you can ski and get a pass for skiing. And you can see the lifts here that uh, for 33 euros a day, and that includes uh, liability insurance. <laughs> they do recommend that you, if you have fancy outfits, that you not wear them because this is not snow, this is a mesh of plastic. So if you fall on this, your clothes have to be tough enough to take it. Okay, I'm moving along. So here is the second to last one. It's quarantine cabin. It's in a place outside of Bar uh, Barcelona. It's done as uh, one of the courses of the Institute of Advanced Architecture in Catalonia <clears throat> at their uh, labs. It's uh, for people who want to master in advanced ecological buildings and bio cities program. And uh, basically these students came for the 2019, 2020 year. It was uh, constructed in uh, <clears throat> between April and August of 2020. And it, uh, because of COVID, it was built as a place for someone to live who's in isolation because of COVID. And this shows a class list and you can see that they're not all Spanish names or people from all over who wanna to come to this program. <clears throat> and here's a plan that shows this and a section. And then there is an unfolded uh, <clears throat> section elevation that shows the cool air stays at the bottom and the warm air is at the top and the wind the windows at the top help to uh, dissipate the heat. Here's an exploded exonometric or isometric, which shows the making, which shows this. I should mention this one thing. Oops. Oops, 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 oops. This right here shows the wood the saw that they use to plane the trees. They cut down 40 trees, thin them out in this park where the lab is. And then they use these to make uh, <clears throat> cross laminated timbers, which then were used to build the whole thing. Uh, there's a, a solar panels on top. There's a garden on top. This shows the interior with the two main windows. This shows what it looked like as a closed object. This, these panels on the outside cover uh, panels of cork, which were used for insulation for the colder nights. This is one of the students working, charring the wood using a uh, Japanese technique called uh, shusugiban which is basically something that burns out a lot of the soft summer wood and then uh, helps to densify the material and give it a uh, waterproof uh, character. The offcuts from <clears throat> the smaller pieces of wood were used for these strips, but they saved and located all the trees. This that we're looking is an interior view, but it shows someone standing on, <clears throat> in the um, in the shower, which is outside the building. This is the bedding on top. So they're 
And here you can see they have tanks to save the water, uh, to heat it when they need it and so forth. Uh, there's storage batteries that were good for, to supply power for 14 days, the quarantine period. And this is a view uh, of the top and some of the interior views. Uh, this is the last project I'll be showing. And this is in uh, <clears throat> uh, Warsaw, Poland. Uh, the architects that call themselves Ecologic Studio. And uh, they basically uh, did experiments creating a uh, playground enclosure that cuts all the pollution of the air. And they chose the most polluted polluted city that they could find. And this shows the air quality index, which some of you may have on your iPhones that tells you when it's safe to go out and play and <clears throat> when you should stay inside. And uh, it's operated by uh, kids playing on inside this uh, plastic envelope. Uh, it saves the water. And uh, the, these diagrams show the clarity uh, immediately within and within the perimeter and a distant perimeter. It's uh, chlorella algae cultures that are used. It's a view of some of the kids playing on it. And here is. I feel stuck in the middle. Do I send them out to play in collision or keep them locked up inside? It's a major problem. Pollution levels are far worse at the child's height. They are more sensitive to the detrimental effects of air pollution. We all grew up going outside and not having to worry about things. I never thought I'd have to protect my kids from the one thing that keeps them alive. As a mom, it breaks my heart. I just want to play. Microalgae are incredible organisms. And with our technology, we can use them to clean our city's air. We've gone to one of Europe's most polluted areas and built the world's first air purifying biotechnological playground. The uniqueness of this concept relies on the relationship between the architecture and the kids. <laughs> The more children play, the more the algae absorb pollutants and clean oxygen is released. This algae is what's taking the bad stuff out of the air. The air feels amazing. <laughs> the key aspects of this project is to create awareness that it is indeed possible to clean the air we breathe. This can't be the only way to help them breathe better. We need to do more. Can we come back tomorrow? So thank you. And uh, we're going to uh, stop the share for a minute or two so that Judy can put up her uh, presentation. I hope you enjoyed. Escape. Sorry, I need to see that.
Okay. Now you have to share it <clears throat> somehow. Do I have screen share? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, Debbie. Okay, I'm Judy. And in this part of our joint presentation, um, I'm going to continue with themes of social and environmental innovation. And I'll concentrate on housing, healthcare, education, and public space. These are topics that I chose because I think they especially matter to us all. <clears throat> so I begin with social housing. Subsidized affordable housing is created with public or private subsidies to benefit low income people in need. Um, and this is a need for which several European countries have proven to be leaders in addressing. So some history, social housing in Western Wait, Judy, Europe. Judy, Judy, you're not on the screen. Your presentation isn't on the screen. So let's get it on the screen. Made a mistake, kids. We'll be right with, go ahead, I'm sorry. What do I do? Um, let's screen go back, share. screen share. Down the bottom. I have nothing on the bottom. Escape like, first. Escape. Okay, now at the bottom, you should have screen share. Sorry, folks. Um, it's and always it difficult be right being brain damaged. There it is. And share. And we're good. Okay, I'm going to unfortunately start again. Maybe you heard me talking, alas and alack, about concentrating on these, on these uh, topics, innovation in housing, healthcare, education, and public space. So some history, I'm sorry. Can you, does it work now, Debbie? Is it okay, Debbie? Is it, it is. okay? It is. Oh, Jane. cool. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm struggling, but I'll be okay. I'm just stupid. What is it? So we're working. Subsidize. So some uh, um, some history. Social housing in Western Europe was initiated in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to confront slums associated largely with industrialization, uh, expanded greatly after World War II to house people left homeless by wartime destruction and amidst continuing migration toward urban centers. Typically erected quickly, these large projects, sometimes called estates, were built at high density with various high or low rise building types. Over the decades, these buildings have deteriorated, many becoming urban ghettos for ethnic minorities while some have endured as viable and cohesive neighborhoods. Still demolition has become all too commonplace. Social housing in Europe. Today, this map and graph track rental social housing as a percentage of all housing in Europe and worldwide. Both show the Netherlands far in the lead, followed by other European countries. Stiff cost constraints prevail everywhere. So innovation, for social gains demands exceptional creativity. From the statistics I show, we could anticipate that some European architects are innovators in design of new social housing. I'll present three quite different examples from France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. <clears throat> First of all, renovate rather than demolish. As Brooke has shown, Reusing existing buildings is far more sustainable than demolishing them to start anew. The French architecture team led by Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal repeatedly follows this principle and has won major awards, including the 2021 Pritzker Prize as a result. That's sometimes called the Nobel Prize for Architects. I'm showing a social housing project that demonstrates their approach. Aging subsidized housing from the 1960s was being demolished in the Grand Park quarter of central Bordeaux, when at the last moment, three tall slabs housing 530 apartment units were saved, their residents intact, and revived through the creative intervention of the architects. These exterior views only hint at the story. The renovation solution 
The renovation solution was largely external, addition of south facing winter gardens and balconies, providing new flexible space and ample daylight to the existing apartments. The upper diagram of one apartment illustrates the removal of existing windows and wall sections in red and the addition of the new spaces in blue. A new glazed winter garden with sun shading thermal curtains with the narrow balcony beyond. New sliding glass doors link to the existing interior rooms as illustrated in the before and after photos below. Hit, hit your screen, the screen. Oops, sorry about that. Hmm. This drawing shows the timing of the work process. Just five days allotted to the new extension, plus a half day for some other refurbishments to kitchens, bathrooms, electrical systems, and at the rear of the building, new elevators and enclosed stairs with uh, new insulation. The changes to daylight in the apartments is palpable, as seen as these before and in these before and after shots of the same living room. And note how this exterior view, you can see it in the bottom right, now opens up to Bordeaux's center. You can see the cathedral in the distance. Residents have adapted the new spaces to fit their needs and tastes, whether for large or for small families. The glazing opened up or closed down to suit shifts in sun and weather. The people in these photographs are the same residents who lived here all along. When the architects were awarded their prize, Anne Lacaton provided this statement, and I quote, transformation is the opportunity of doing more and better with what is already existing. Demolishing is a decision of easiness and short term. It's a waste of many things, a waste of energy, a waste of material, and a waste of history. Moreover, it has a very negative social impact. For us, it is an act of violence. A second example of social housing takes us to Belgium and to a project that highlights sustainability and, uh, sustainability and adaptive reuse. The Savarny Hemans here was once a soap manufacturer, thus the name. The old factory and contaminated land converted by MDW architecture into 43 units of passive or low energy public housing suited to the diverse population of central Brussels, a mixture of young people and immigrants in this urban courtyard scheme. These views show the complex as seen from the street and its courtyard interior with reused factory structure. A note the end facade with um, the old sign in both the old and new photos. The architects wanted to achieve a village-like setting with distinct areas for play, a main square for gathering, and a so-called forest garden. The scheme also includes a meeting room, a daycare, a game library, along with the various housing types. Some of the old structures were indeed preserved. So this is an ambitious program for a very dense site. Strategies for sustainability include, include glass enclosed lodges on the south facing facades for thermal and acoustic barriers, green roofs, co-generation of heat and electricity, solar heated hot water, rainwater harvested for toilets, and more. The old factory chimney now ventilates an underground parking garage. The housing types include apartments, lofts, duplexes, and maisonettes with between one and six bedrooms. So there's something for everyone, all 100% public. Given this multifaceted transformation from derelict industrial site to sustainable neighborhood, it's no surprise that the Savonry Hemans is considered a, mo a model social housing project. Now to a third example, to and to the Netherlands, a third example of social housing, to that country ranked highest in Europe for cost controlled rental uh, units. Most Dutch housing is semi-detached or terraced, row house type units, rather than apartment buildings. A direct connection to the ground seems essential. Here's some background, for decades now, Dutch cities have experienced steeply rising housing costs, 
so that ordinary middle-class people lack affordable options. This should sound familiar. In the early 1990s, the Dutch government set out to counter this trend by identifying locations outside the city centers for some new developments, like this area of reclaimed land called Ippenberg, where reasonably priced market housing is combined with low cost social housing. Amidst the new islands of housing projects shown on the lower left, only the colorful Hagen Island housing by the Dutch uh, famous firm MVDRV is, uh, fills that 30% social housing requirement for Epenburg. So there's no preservation involved here. This is an example of entirely new construction on entirely new land. In these new developments, car-free access to local services and public transit to nearby cities were a requirement. Hagen Island is shown here on the map on the right in relation to the Hag and to Delft, the closest cities. The architect's goal was to nurture community. They developed a porous design approach, their term, shown in these site diagrams, breaking up typically long rows of houses into a looser offset pattern, integrating private and shared green spaces, pedestrian walkways and playgrounds. It's a, a child-free, friendly environment. The architects designed traditional house forms with pitched roofs and bright colors, um, intending to affirm the uh, Dutch cultural, cultural identity of the residents. Yet to fit the tight cost controls, only one material clads both roof and walls without added details like, oh say gutters or shutters. Each dwelling has a private garden with a greenhouse connected with the walkways and playgrounds within the development while parking is reserved at the perimeter. The unit plans, the lower views are all alike. Kitchens and living spaces at ground level, bedrooms on the second with the top attic floor left open and flexible for the residents' uh, imaginations. Internal views of Hagen Island show how the private and shared elements combined. Features that contribute to the widely noted success of this project. Hagen Island has now been inhabited for 18 years and reports from residents indicate the project is largely popular, even if there are more cars than the designers had hoped. So housing innovation is not limited to low cost solutions. Following our two exceptional market rate housing schemes, both as it happens still in the Netherlands. The successor firm of one of the Netherlands most esteemed post-war architects, Herman Herzberger, carries forward his priorities for human and community-based design. The Passwerk housing near Harlem is a good example. The project surroundings along the river Sparn are part of a designated greenbelt zone. In medieval times, this site was used for peat excavation and the surviving east-west ditches and laying ponds. Also, some stands of very old trees have been saved. The compact, housing development was designed to enhance this historic topography. The ditches and ponds configured as elongated waterways within the site, as the site plan drawing to the left and these photos depict. This delicacy of intervention is the lesson in intervention, intervention uh, excuse me, in innovation here. A mixture of patio and townhouses provides variety in living options, all with connection to the outdoors and incorporating sustainability features. The usual solar collectors, collectors along with moss roofs, the moss covering reducing cooling load and absorbing rainwater, also, which also, and also runoff goes into the ponds. Access roads run through the site, but the common outdoor spaces are car free. All parking is hidden in underground garages somehow. I'm not sure how. Interior spaces are open and airy, main, um, main spaces and terraces facing south. Needless to say, owners have treated their own interiors differently, not all as spare and white as this. So whatever the season, connection to the sound surrounding parkland and waterways is always welcome. Schoonship in Amsterdam, 
is an extraordinary example of a fully sustainable community. In the Netherlands, rising seas pose an ever present threat. Remember your finger in the dike. So why not opt to live directly upon the water? Newly completed, this Dutch community indeed floats. Its name means clean ship and it calls itself a circular neighborhood. Circularity is a process of recycling in contrast with the wastefulness of linearity, a continuous loop involving all aspects of living. Shunship was, sorry, Shunship was initiated in 2010 by a group of future residents, private citizens who worked with experts to realize their dream for a fully sustainable and energy neutral uh, environment. Space and Matter are circular design specialists who developed the site plan, its 30 water plots, and its connecting infrastructure for the 100 residents who now live in single and duplex arcs, their name for their dwellings, each designed by the owner's own architects, thus yielding a lively visual mix. The houses were manufactured remotely and brought by barge to the community site in a former industrial area of Northern Amsterdam, where they're moored to the riverbed. Once the houses were in place, a final smart jetty, uh, those segments uh, of the interconnecting infrastructure were installed. This circular community was designed from the start to be sustainable at every level, not just in smart and ecological building technologies, but also in governance, economics, health, and food supply as defined in, defined in this comprehensive plan drawing. Shared electric vehicles would be parked on land. See the overview rendering above. There they are on land. Mm -hmm. um, and wherever they are, um, which also, and that upper drawing also shows their floating waste treatment barge. The smart jetty serves as a pedestrian walkway, but also carries all those services below the deck. All the houses are positioned to have views of the water and of the neighborhood as a whole. The households have expanded during the prolonged collaborative design process, and many now have children, several. Um, on the other hand, what if you own something really heavy, perhaps a grand piano? Then weights are positioned for balance at the opposite end of your arc. The diversity of house designs hides underlying, underlying coordination of size, type, and position. The arc types and sites are shown in the diagram at upper right. Each arc is highly energy efficient with rooftop solar panels connected to the smart grid, which also powers the electric cars and cargo bikes. Renewable water, energy and waste systems, submerged heat exchangers for heating and cooling are all part of their circular community model. So this section diagram is complicated, intended to portray all these interconnected features. However, it does remind me of the hippie graphics of my youth. Perhaps Shunship is something of a 21st century commune. Still, the appeal of Shunship is strong, especially in fine weather, even while the surrounding area has grown up considerably. The community has not yet been tested over time, but the concept uh, is intriguing, innovative indeed. Shunship's website shares their circular community experience, an open source for future projects. Um, so I invite you to check it out. But meanwhile, we're ready for a big change of topic. Let's go to healthcare. The HAQ index as mapped globally indicates access and quality of healthcare for individuals. The world map shows a dark purple covering most of Western Europe ranking these countries highest along with Canada and Australia at above 86 on a scale of 100. In some parts of, uh, parts of the world, you will note the ranks are grim. The Global Health Security Index for Europe to the left offers more detail differently factored. Health security in England, the dark green, is highest. Europe's overall success draws largely from the provision of universal health care, delivered differently in each country, but regulated by law to ensure access for all. 
However, universal health care doesn't necessarily yield great buildings, especially hospitals typically cumbersome as architecture, ever expanding with rabbit warrens of highly specific windowless spaces connected by endless hallways. We've all been there. By contrast, one new European hospital merits some attention. The hospital Nova in Vaskila in central Finland was completed in 2020 and opened just in as COVID arrived. Innovation in this design lies in its approach to the major change in health care delivery nearly everywhere, with patients now spending far less time in hospital, but far more time in outpatient treatments. This is the first all new hospital to be built in Finland since 1970. And the architect's goal was to combine a next generation clinical facility with Finnish appreciation of nature and exemplary design. Its bold forms contain elegant interior spaces where patient focus and procedural efficiency are overriding goals. Four distinct areas comprise, comprise the building and explain its form, each part given a catchy name by the architects. You know, the patient rooms are yellow. Um, the outpatient areas are pink. Uh, that's the healthcare shopping mall. The hot hospital for surgeries and specialized care is in green. And then below in gray in the lower diagrams is the factory support spaces. Um, and at the bottom you see adjacency diagrams that show kind of this, the way they uh, assembled their final form. A long public atrium links these functions within. Health professionals, rather than patients, move around um, to 360 different outpatient consulting rooms. So it's intentionally non-hierarchical. The whole medical staff share one large knowledge center, not separate offices, to facilitate communications. Within the atrium, abstract wooden constructions and a log cabin kiosk, that's for kids care, are intended as reminders of the Finnish environment. Finnish artists indeed have provided these and other artworks throughout the hospital. The metal scrim that surrounds the atrium allows for views of activities in the flanking outpatient uh, areas. All the patient rooms are single occupancy with private bathrooms and views to the outdoors, clean, airy, functional. So from the outside, this is a very big building uh, within its forested surrounds, but held to a relatively low scale. And I leave you with a parting question about this hospital. Can a new hospital indeed address inevitable change in a field as dynamic as medicine? Time, of course, will tell, but the hope is yes. One hint of this here, many internal systems like the bathrooms are modular and can be easily unplugged and upgraded. By strong contrast, here's innovative healthcare at a very small scale. Maggie's is a charity providing free cancer support and information for anyone affected by the disease at centers across the UK and beyond. Access to support specialists, psychologists, and benefits advisors. The charity was founded by Maggie Keswick Jenks, a terminally ill woman frustrated by waiting for care in cramped, gloomy corridors. She envisioned better care through design, and as it happened, her husband and co-founder was an architectural historian, Charles Jenks. Maggie died in 1995, but the program she initi initiated is growing extensively. All the centers are designed by notable architects, many garnishing design awards, like this Maggie Center in Lanarkshire, Scotland. The center is sited amidst mature lime trees retained from an historic estate where its affiliated Monklands Hospital is located. The articulated brick wall of the Maggie Center encloses gardens that are the main feature of the center. The gathering and consulting spaces have ample glass openings to these gardens and to internal courtyards. Tranquility and domestic scale characterize the building's interior. Overhead structure, internal partitions, and flooring are of finished birch, while muted furnishings and selected artworks add warmth to the spaces. So here's one other Maggie Center in passing. 
in Manchester, England by the famous firm of uh, uh, Lord Norman Foster. I won't describe it, rather let you enjoy its transparency and garden setting. This center, like the one in Lanarkshire, is a far cry from most cancer facilities you or my might have experienced. So rather, so whether at large scale or small, there is promise for humane and equitable appealing design in medical facilities. Now let's turn to the field of education. According to the OECD's most recent global assessment of 15 year old students, Several European countries, notably Estonia and Finland, rank especially high in the fields of reading, math, and science. Finland will be focusing on. Much has been published about the success of Finnish education, credited to such things as the absence of standardized testing, yippee, rigorously educated and well-paid teachers, school environments fostering social equity, only nine years of compulsory schooling with short school days and little homework. How on earth do they do this? And uh, afterwards, post-secondary options in trades and academics, pretty amazing. So I'll show one Finnish school that combines um, those uh, uh, um, features along with distinctive architecture. Um, let's say these uh, ideas of putting learning on display. The belief that education lies largely outside the traditional classroom is embedded in the design of this future school for grades one through nine, providing spaces open to various forms of community and interaction with emphasis on art and physical education. The Saunalati school is located in a newly developed part of Espo, a small city near Helsinki. Beyond regular teaching spaces, it incorporates a daycare, preschool, branch library, an after-school youth club and weekend workshop access. These photos, photos show connections between interior and exterior social spaces, embraced and sheltered by an overhanging roof. The school building, excuse me, is cited to orient these spaces to optimal sun exposure and to buffer them from the adjacent busy town street. The main floor centers around a spacious multi-purpose heart space. Here we go, heart space, which also serves as the school cafeteria with adjacent auditorium and all those uh, community shared spaces. A separate wing, it's far to the upper right on the plan, houses the lower grade classrooms with their own home gathering space and uh, classrooms for older students are on the upper level. The classrooms are furnished to facilitate independent and group learning. Um, with lots of interior windows to provide connections among these spaces or even within them. Fitness, play, and crafts are a central part of the curriculum. Here are a wood shop, a gym, and an art space. A material palette of brick, concrete, wood, and glass is artfully composed, particularly the patterned exterior brickwork and composition of window openings. Again, the center of this future school is that communal heart space where indoors and outdoors, school and community are connected. The South Harbor School in Copenhagen, back to Copenhagen, is an adventuresome building, both inside and out, with new physical experiences intrinsic to its teaching mission. Denmark has solid rankings on that piece of chart not far below the US and UK and is investing, investing actively in education and its architecture. Copenhagen is growing rapidly, over a thousand new citizens a month, that's a lot. And this former industrial area has been transformed as residential, thus needing a new school. One that meets current priorities for active learning and social development. This school is both physically and educationally stimulating. Its urban building, its, its urban site uh, is constrained, hence the rooftop serves as a schoolyard. Is this cascading form architecture or is it landscape? <clears throat> On its ground level, the school is transparent and welcoming to its surrounding community. Large displays opening 
openings revealing interior spaces. As at the Sanolaji School in Finland, a communal meeting space, a sort of interior city square, incorporates multiple social areas from dining to a wide staircase for informal gatherings. These cutaway drawings show in yellow how the common spaces flow upward through the building, connecting the various learning areas distributed on fly five floors. Spaces for primary grades are on the lower floor with secondary uh, up above. A tall central atrium serves the overall environmental design, enabling, enabling natural ventilation and admitting ample daylight. A variety of energy saving solutions are also included, the green roof, solar collectors that we now see almost everywhere. Color adds surprise and stimulus to all types of teaching, cooking and crafts areas among them. Go figure, green for cooking, it knocks me out. Spatial variety too, intended to stimulate learning, is, is apparent everywhere with co contrast and scale between group spaces like the great green stair and intimate alcoves or window seats. Most astonishing, of course, is the school's roofscape, used both for play and teaching, uh, also for community gathering, a generous gesture and invitation to the surrounding city. The cascading rooftop at the South Harbor School in Copenhagen provides indeed a public community space. And so our uh, collaborative survey of social and environmental innovation fittingly should culminate in the public outdoor realm. Beautiful and varied public spaces grace most European cities, memorable to those of us fortunate to visit. Some are new, perhaps transformations of former industrial sites, where others are old, beloved gardens or city squares. Active or passive, large or small, green or paved, they are all magnets for human interaction. So I've selected just two new European public spaces that engage the past and propose new forms of social interaction to bring our presentations to a close. So first to Albania. This vast public space, the historical central square in Albania's capital city, Tirana, was reconceived by a Belgian firm, along with Albanian artist Anri Sala, and completed in 2017. They were awarded the project through an international design competition. The square, named after an historic national hero, and now a popular gathering space, is framed by numerous public buildings national ministries, cultural institutions, city hall, a central mosque, a clock tower. The square, along with its radiating roads, was carved out of the dense core of the old Ottoman town in the 1920s, after Tirana was made capital of the new Albanian monarchy, a transformation that was based on Western European uh, urban design ideas. See the upper right. Then, under the communist regime of Enver Hoxha, large modern structures were added, of which most remain today. By the early 2000s, after the fall of communism, then the automobile took over. So ideas for reclaiming this space evolved. The competition took place, and the winning scheme was finally completed. The scope of the design includes more then the central plaza, also the adjacent Europe Park, as well as garden spaces around um, some of the cultural institutions, welcome green spaces that are shown in the site plan drawing to the left. The plaza itself rises slightly to a center point, formed as a very shallow pyramid, it's hard even to see in the photographs, and paved with stones quarried from all parts of Albania. Water provides areas of cooling, spreading in elliptical flows created by the pyramid's slight slopes. Shade structures add welcome shelter suited to this Mediterranean climate and uh, more uh, intimate sitting spaces. All parts of the square are accessible, open to many types of activity. The square's communist era past remains in the surrounding buildings. It hasn't been erased, rather revised as a less dominating frame to the larger whole. The planted areas represent Albania's diverse ecologies, adding shade, variety, and national identity. 
12 distinct gardens associated with these surrounding institutions. The new Skanderbeg Square is an excellent example of regeneration of existing public space for the benefit of the local people. And it has received numerous awards, one applauding the design for its openness to citizen involvement as noted in the text I've added here. These photos of people, lots of them old enough to have experienced Albania's darker times, very darker times, are good uh, evidence of the park's success. Special celebrations are welcome in the new Skanderbeg Square, including Tirana's annual Christmas market. And so we return, yes, again to Copenhagen, where Brooke and I soon discovered that the, it's this city where we've both found inspiration. I think a field trip is due. Also, this is, is our second example of work by the Danish firm Big, B-I-G. Yes, Big again, the multidisciplinary firm led by Bjorke Engels, internationally famous and part of a new generation of architects that combine shrewd analysis, playful experimentation, social responsibility, and humor. I quoted there. So here's a project, our final one that captures Big's collaborative and optimistic spirit with an ambitious social goal. As already noted, Copenhagen's been growing rapidly, due in large part to immigration from other parts of the world, many landing in the ethnically diverse Norobro district, people of limited means and little access to shared public space. Here's an aerial view of Norobro and in the lower uh, left, you'll see um, you'll you'll see a half mile long linear park sited on the underutilized space of a former rail line. The new park is called Superkilen, which means big wedge, and its design is a celebration of diversity. Begun with a design competition in 07, the concept for an interactive park for Norebro originated with a Danish arts collective named Superflex, along with big and German landscape practice Topotec One. The linear park consists of three zones. Zooming in, we see a red square. Uh, it's geared to skaters and active sports. The black market, mostly for gathering um, and young people. And a green park, a uh, welcome space for big sports and play, all incorporating elements representing cultures from around the world. A popular Copenhagen bicycle route traverses the entire park. Extreme public participation is the term invented by, uh, for the design process, essential to the goal of bringing locals and refugees together to promote, to promote inclusion and tolerance, tolerance of religion, ethnicity, and culture. The designers avoided traditional Danish park furniture, those benches and play equipment and such, rather asked local people to nominate objects from other countries, often their own homelands, which were either imported or created locally at full scale. It's this varied collection of objects, a hundred of them in total, dispersed throughout the park that are key to its inclusive design, where potentially jarring combinations are considered very welcome. Here's a video that describes the park perhaps better than me. This area is one of the areas in, in Copenhagen with the highest crime rate, or maybe even in, inside them, like it felt very unsecure. To make the Norebro neighborhood safer, the City Hall of Copenhagen decided to create a big public park. Architect Nana Gilto Muller and artist Rasmus Nielsen were in charge of the project. In our very first walk through the area, we could see that there was a big diversity in the people living in the neighborhood. We, we found that it was around 60 different nations living in the area. And rather than seeing the diversity as a problem, we wanted to see it as a resource. So basically that in the park there would be elements from as many countries of the people living here uh, through objects and stories. 
the golden one is a playground from India, and uh, the elephant slide is from Chernobyl, and um, the red benches over there are kind of a double bench from Switzerland. And also one of our favorites is the, the Moroccan fountain, where parents often sit and meet and talk while the kids are playing. The idea of the park was to make use of dreams that could kind of materialize into things. We divided the area in like three parts. They're all three areas. They are very different. The red square is uh, mainly for skaters. Yeah, the black square is more classical square, where the locals are hanging out and kids are playing. And then the green park is more uh, for exercise and uh, more bigger sports activities. It's, it's pretty easy to see today that all these different activities, they make people meet. For me, that's one of the, the greatest things to see that people like can meet in the area. To create a public space where people from a very diverse sort of background would sort of feel at home. Our motto yes is more. It's uh, it's very much about not saying no and saying yes. So we do wonder what you think of Super Kilan. The accolades abound, including the prestigious Aga Khan Award. They made the video. And for my part, I think we should simply all visit. So thank you all very much for joining us today. We hope the European projects we've shown stimulate your thoughts about architecture's potential to address some of the social and environmental challenges we're all confronting. And now it's our turn to hear from you to respond to your questions. So I'm turning this uh, screen back to Debbie. Okay, thank you so much. That was so informative. And as a retired educator, I would love to have been able to teach in one of those new buildings. So welcoming and airy and bright. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So let me go down to chat. Okay, and let me go to the very beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, this is um, from Karen Gleason. And this is when Brooke was speaking about rammed earth. How does that work with earthquakes? And how do each of these building techniques go with the ambient conditions? What, whatever the special conditions of each of these projects. So Brooke, that's for you. When the question about each of these projects, all 10 or just the rammed earth? The rammed earth. How does that work with earthquakes? It works in maybe a similar way to uh, the Japanese construction. All of the village is built using this old technique. So it's, it's a, a local way of building and it's one where people can rebuild themselves. Okay. Um... And then she said, how do each of these building techniques go with ambient conditions? Okay. Now, I know that's, that's um, a big question, but I knew that we were gonna be seeing a lot of different circumstances. And I was, I, I was questioning a good thing using ambient techniques, a good thing using old techniques, but sometimes an old technique falls down and a new technique would not, you know. So I, I just wanted a sort of a general question of, as you're looking at different techniques, how are they specialized, uh, especially adapted? Like at the very end, we get to the fact that we're gonna have sea level rise in the Netherlands and some of the buildings float, which uh, I'd actually heard about already. So I was glad to finally see a picture of that. But that it's kind of a general question. So I'm sorry, it's just a consideration of looks beautiful, but how does it work for reality? Um, for instance, we were in a hotel in Reykjavik and it was wonderful having a lot of sunlight, but in the summertime, you didn't want sunlight in your bedroom. You wanted to be able to sleep. It got too hot. 
um, the rest of the year, there was no sun. So it was excellent to have sun coming in. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, you have to kind of think of everything when you're creating a building. Amen. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll go on to the next one. This one's from George, as, and this is for Brooke. As visually attractive and formally innovative as these examples are, could you please describe how they contribute to social and environmental innovation? Well, since I showed 10 of them, one of the things has to do with uh, social equity and also reuse of uh, materials we have. And it's usually the case that the reuse of something, adaptive reuse is more economical and more appropriate than to start from ground zero and create everything anew, uh, especially when you consider uh, that a lot of places around the world aren't as fortunate as we are with the uh, access we have to materials. So um, that's, that's a big dilemma. One of the flip sides of innovation is the uh, use of resources uh, that, that that demands. So that when you look at these countries that have the highest uh, value added productivity and, uh, <clears throat> and innovation, they're often the countries that use a disproportionate amount of resources of the earth. So that's, uh, that's just the way things happen. It's, it's a balance that we have to figure out. Uh, so South Korea, for instance, needs, if everybody lived like a citizen of South Korea, uh, they would need something like eight planets, planet Earth. We in the US need five planet Earth to live the way we do. If everybody in the world lived at the same level as we do, there aren't enough resources in the entire world for that to occur. So we have to, for social equity, we have to think about the most economical way to bring about change or actually bring about sustainable living. Does that help? I, I think so. <laughs> he hasn't added or asked another question, so I think so. Thank you. Okay, Brooke, I think this one's for you also. I'm yeah. not sure, I kind of lost track there. Um, this, this is from Paul. Statistics of life of buildings is 50 years. Yeah. Is that an average between, say, mud huts and steel towers? Or is that what clients, architects are planning for the life, build it, and 49 years later work on its demolition? Seems like we can plan on life of several hundred years to maximize use of materials and energy inputs. Question. Well, it yeah, it changes. Obviously, uh, the icons that we looked at culturally long outlive their uh, physical useful times. I mean, the, the notion that we put art in museums is kind of horrendous, that we have to have a separate place to store our culture because we don't live with it every day. So it's uh, the Great Wall of China still survives. It's falling apart, but it still survives. Whether it's uh, sustainable living as a model, that's something else. So to just the 50 year factor is a kind of a very generalized estimate on what one might expect to be the lifespan of a building that one designs or one builds. Um, in fact, most very often we're, we're lucky if we get 50 years. 
Um, but, it, and as Brooke points out, many famous buildings have long outlasted, but many others get demolished within horrendously short times. And obviously the better we build, the longer the prospects are. And also the more flexibly we build so that a building might have other potential uses, which we've shown Brooke, uh, particularly in some adaptive reuse examples like the Carlsberg um, Brewery uh, site. Anyway, enough said. Okay, thank you. Okay, this one's for you, Judy. Is the project in The Hague also floatable for future sea level rising? Say, so I'd like them to float it right over to my house because I think it's great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but no, uh, unfortunately, uh, to build a floating building, you have to plan it from the get go. It, it's basically built on a barge like base. And those buildings were built with traditional foundations on the land that, you know, of that, of that area that, which is not in itself reclaimed land. In fact, it was an old peat excavation site, as I think I said. So no, sadly, um, but you could bring one to Cushing. Anyway, uh, Gerardo would like to add. Yeah, I would like to add because the, the, I think she was referring to the VNRDV project in uh, Ippenberg. Oh. And that's a reclaimed former airport. Air, bear, air base and the, and the and the water there is actually they dug to create the canals because Dutch people need to have water. <laughs> Thanks for that. This everything, nothing I read quite got to that level. Thank you. Okay, and then Karen also added when you were talking about the Maggie centers that the Alphonse Center in Augusta had many of these same features: chemotherapy and chair looking out on the garden areas. So hopefully we're starting to bring that type of architect to at least Maine. <laughs> right, so one of, the, one of the great difficulties for Brooke and me in, uh, in creating these presentations or in looking at Europe uh, because of the larger conference topic um, was, um, countering Europe's offerings against what's out there in the whole world. Frankly, there's great architecture everywhere. Uh, and we're more and more aware of it. Old buildings and new all around the globe. It's kind of, um, it's almost a false parenthesis to limit it to, to Europe. Um, but, but we did find that uh, advances in technologies, Brooke showed many of them, or in attention to social qualities, the schools and so forth, um, were very strong in European. Those, those uh, uh, statistics we um, unearthed were, are, are, were compelling to us in terms of how we framed what types of project we would show today. Okay. Thank you. And then Ellen had a question, a comment and a question, and you half answered it. Um, if there were a conference from a European country, America, challenged at home and abroad, would they find varied and exciting projects as you and Brooke did? Architectural strength, utility, and innovations in public housing, healthcare, education, and public space? <laughs> in some places, okay. I mean, if we if there's, a, there's a lot to look at. Um, we've we've made a lot of mistakes. Um, so that being said, um, I, you know, I, if you start looking, you will find good things all over the place. Um, but I do I do think Europe has um, has a long uh, track record and 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 a great uh, capacity for innovation. You're. Uh, architecture schools and engineering programs, uh, civil engineering programs in Europe are uh, put a lot of uh, effort into research and experimentation more so than we do. And I think a lot of that bleeds over into the, uh, the practice of uh, making buildings. So um, they have a good fortune at that level. Um, and gosh, when you 
go out into the world and look for new buildings. European architects are out there doing extraordinary things. And I would wager to say, and uh, this is a bit off the top of my head, that the Europeans are out and about in the world more so than American architects. And that's because we aren't quite as adventuresome in how we build. Maybe it's liability issues that hamper us, but I don't wanna get into that. I don't practice architecture anymore. And a younger generation could speak to these things perhaps more uh, adeptly. Okay, thank you. That's it for the chat questions. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? Go right ahead. Okay, well then, um, if we don't have any more questions, then I'm going to thank you for such an interesting presentation. Both of you did a wonderful job. Totally enjoyed it. I see some comments coming up thanking you um, for your job. And hopefully next year we'll have you back. <laughs> Gosh. Thank you, folks.